Lee Harvey Oswald probably was a great American patriot. 50th anniversary of the Warren Commission, uh, a document that I think we could just throw out the window and rewrite and start all over again. Yeah, you know, it's it's amazing, George. And one of the most interesting things is the uh, the gap between what many of us have come to believe and what the establishment continues to tell us. This is really quite extraordinary. You've seen the polls anywhere from 60 to 85 percent of Americans no longer believe the official story on the Kennedy assassination. We've seen hundreds, I think, more than a thousand books on this subject. The vast, vast majority, all of these people doing tremendous amounts of research, concluding that Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone, and in fact, the vast majority of the books concluding that he did not act, that he did not act at all, that it had nothing to do with Lee Harvey Oswald. So here we are, half a century later, uh, we've seen millions of documents declassified. Uh, they've held back, importantly, uh, a number of documents. We think about 50,000 that they are due to release in 2017. So we still have this tremendous uh, national mystery, really. You might say this is the national whodunit, and it is perhaps the world's whodunit. Still not resolved. Who named the commissioners? Was it Johnson? How were they appointed, Russ? This is very difficult to sort out, but it looks like this was predetermined by Lyndon Johnson and a circle of people around him. Now, who actually was determining this is key. What I have found in my research is that Warren was not that important and that, in fact, he was marginalized early on. Warren wanted to bring in a, a particular staff director, a guy named Warren Olney. Uh, but in any case, they didn't want Warren Olney. When I say they, that was whoever these people were who were trying to shape what the Warren Commission did. And instead, uh, they ensured that it was somebody else, a guy named J. Lee Rankin, who had been the solicitor general or the top lawyer uh, for the United States for uh, eight years under Eisenhower. And so right away you see that this guy Warren is basically a figurehead. Now, who did they want on there? My research suggests that the people they wanted on there, there were two really, or three rather, and they were John J. McCloy. John McCoy was basically the lawyer for the Rockefellers, and they wanted a guy named Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford altered uh, uh, the language of the report. This is a key point because uh, all of the critical people, the doctors involved, the autopsy, the uh, early on they saw that the bullet, the uh, the first bullet uh, entered Kennedy's back, and they said it entered his back. And unfortunately for, for them, if it entered his back, it could not possibly have come out uh, his throat in the front. And this was a problem if they were going to say that Oswald did it. And I, I can get into all that. But in any case, uh, uh, Ford altered it to say that it basically entered his throat, his neck, rather. So that was Ford. And then the third one, and I think this is the most important of all, and the least appropriate person to even have been on that commission was Alan Dulles. Now, Alan Dulles had been the head of the CIA, and the CIA had been in the business for quite a while of going into various countries and removing presidents. He also, uh, at the time of the Warren Commission, I mean, he was unemployed and he had nothing to do. And so it's quite interesting that many people, including myself, are very, very interested in just how he spent uh, his time. And that gets to indications that various key CIA personnel very close to him may have had contact with Oswald and may have been in Dallas, Texas on November 22, 1963. And uh, it is just amazing that Dulles would be named to be on the commission. And with everyone knowing that he hated Kennedy, it just, it's bizarre. So the the commission today, 50 years later, is it relevant? You know, it's extremely relevant because if you look at our country in the intervening years, there have been how many commissions? I mean, I'm sure you've covered a lot oh, of these yeah. ones. We 
you know that you know what I'm talking about. I, I, Iran Contra and nine uh, eleven, and uh, you know they've had commissions on. I mean, everything, <laughs> and and we have this legacy of these commissions with these so-called you know sort of trusted citizens distinguished citizens who are going to get to the bottom of things and i mean i think the legacy is the warren commission was the first of these really big commissions that put on this tremendous act you know put out this massive report with 26 volumes uh, of exhibits and it's just nonsense and you can see it's nonsense when you go through these things and you begin to realize that our government uh frankly is not in the business of leveling with us they never have you know they really haven't and i think one of the key things that have become clear to me as i go through this and it's it really is in the granular details that you just you know kind of smack your head on the side and you say oh my gosh not even government it's the establishment it's the it's big banks it's uh, big companies it's the uh, it's the military contracting establishment basically making sure uh, that the apple cart is not overturned and i think what we learn when we research that there really is a very fine line between the so-called underworld, you know, they talk about did the mob do it and so on, between the underworld and what you might call the overworld, the overworld, George, the wealthy interests, the big outfits. And you start finding out the extent to which there is a kind of an unspoken accommodation in order to get business done. And that, I think, is just something that is so stark when you look very, very closely uh, at what happened in Dallas. And if you look at who was on the commission and what kinds of people they associated. If you look at the extent to which agencies like the CIA and the FBI cooperated with organized crime, cooperated with disorganized crime, with all sorts of disreputable interests in order to achieve what they needed to achieve. The FBI has a long history of using people who themselves are committing crimes in order to prosecute others. And so mm -hmm. there's this c tremendous mix. Is it too late, Russ, to establish a new commission to investigate JFK's assassination? I don't think it is. The, one of the reasons that I am continuing to research this is even at this late date, we are finding things, we are connecting the dots. And one of the wonderful tools is, although we've lost decades and many of the people who know things have died, the internet and computers have permitted us to use these new tools, frankly, to find things that were hidden or were missing, uh, and to connect the dots to create a larger picture. Did they all know what was going on? I mean, were they all in on it? I began looking at this, and uh, I just said, my gosh, you know, this really is the story of essentially a coup d'etat in our own country, a coup d'etat against democracy. And it was so stunning to me, George, it was so unsettling to me that a country where I am proud uh, to stand and to salute and to sing our national anthem, where we constantly talk about freedom and transparency and that we the people and that this is our country and to learn that that isn't always the case and to learn that the, the much vaunted democracy is very much hemmed in that it's a very very narrow democracy and we begin to understand why it is that whether we have a republican or a democrat in the white house so many of the policies are the same particularly right. when we look in two areas, domestically, when we look at the economy and the control of the economy by a small number of very, very large and increasingly concentrated corporations, and when we look internationally at the constant use of war-making as a tool, again, relating to our economy, and we see that whether it's an Obama or it's a Bush or whoever it is, that they pursue fairly similar 
strategies and that we see these constants. We see the same people being cycled in and out and in and out from the same big Wall Street firms and the same giant universities. We see uh, the Pentagon uh, remaining so dominant, the Central Intelligence Agency so dominant, and we say, who really runs this country? And I think that it's crucial that we explore the Kennedy assassination, look at things like the Warren Commission to figure out what these things were, who really were behind them, how did they operate, in order to figure out what happened to our country, what has happened to our country, what is happening to our country, and what will happen to our country. Was there something that the commission was just petrified about releasing? Yeah, you know, this is very interesting. They seem to have been petrified about releasing all kinds of things. And in January of 1964, they discovered several things, and they were so concerned about them that, well, first of all, they often went into executive session, and they said that their sessions were top secret. They classified them top secret, even though they weren't authorized to do that. And in one of these sessions, they actually determined that no notes were to be taken. And Alan Dulles actually said, can we have the records of this meeting, please, be destroyed? Now, the only reason we know about it is because even though that was supposed to happen, it didn't happen. Uh, There was a stenographer for part of it. Also, we find out later that Rankin kept some notes from it, and also others who had come to meet with the commission uh, reported about it back to the FBI, which kept their own reports, and so we do have a record of this thing that wasn't supposed to exist anymore. They talked principally about something they were deeply concerned about, and that was that they were finding uh, there at least were possibilities that Lee Harvey Oswald had been either or an FBI informant or had some sort of connection with the Central Intelligence Agency. The Warren Commission, were they afraid of the reaction of the American people to the fact that that this was a coup, or was there something else afoot? I think that their problems began with the fact that they never were even given an opportunity to look into anything. J. Edgar Hoover a virtual dictator in this country, the head of the FBI, decided together with Lyndon Johnson right away after the assassination that this thing could never be investigated. He supposedly conducted an investigation. They were done almost immediately. They determined that they were going to say that it was Oswald and that Oswald had done it alone. And so when it became clear that there was going to need to be a commission and the appearance of a serious inquiry by independent individuals, the FBI rushed to leak the results of its findings that Oswald had done it alone. And so when the commission came into existence, they were basically required to conclude similarly to the FBI. And so commission document number one is the 900-page FBI report, which amazingly had about 10 words on Kennedy's shooting, 42 words on his wounds, did not explain the particulars of the shots fired, did not mention John Connolly's wounds. John Connolly, of course, the governor of Texas, sitting with Kennedy, a wounded by a shooter, uh, did not even mention the actual cause of Kennedy's death. And basically, the whole thing uh, was one long uh, rant about Oswald. It was all about how terrible Oswald was, and you know, here's his background and so forth. That was what the Warren Commission faced when they came in. So that was a problem. And then it was made very, very clear to them that they were supposed to confirm this. So that was a problem to begin with. And then, of course, when you start drilling down into who the commissioners were, who the staff members were, there's a fascinating revelation as to the nature of the American establishment itself and how it also was very, very eager to cover up the truth. It truly was one of those reports that uh, was really a whitewash. What about other governments, Russ? What did they think of the Warren Commission? 
when you go back and you look at information inquiries that came in, certainly from some of our allies in Europe, uh, as well as much of the third world, it's very, very clear that almost nobody except the United States were willing to come to the same conclusion. There were inquiries and reports, particularly, say, from French intelligence and so forth, indicating that that they thought that there was more going on. And we certainly saw it in the media. The American media almost immediately closed ranks around the Oswald did it story. But we have to turn to, again, the French, the Germans, the Italians, the Dutch, on and on and on. And, and interestingly, not just uh, the, the, some of the governments over there and the media over there, but, but individuals began almost immediately researching this and writing books because they all felt that the world was influenced by this, that the world had been robbed of an opportunity with the premature uh, removal of an American president that they liked, that they loved, that they believed in, that they thought was interested uh, in a better world for all. And so it really is quite striking when you see the tremendous contrast. And even today, uh, uh, again, the American establishment, uh, whether it's our media, our textbook publishers, uh, our universities, still going with this Oswald did it story pretty much all the rest of the world, George, saying something else. Uh, and another possibility is that Oswald was not even sent to Soviet Union with the idea that the Soviets would believe that he was a real defector, because they never did. They never trusted him for many, many uh, logical reasons, but that he was being what they call sheep-dipped, so that they could then send him back to the United States as a so-called leftist, and then use him to infiltrate all kinds of movements. And, of course, that's exactly huh. what he did. Remember, he went to New Orleans. Yeah, and fair play for out. Cuba. Remember that? Yep, yeah, that's right. That's right. Of everything in the Warren Commission, what area for you, Russ, just is the most fascinating? I specialized in a fellow on the commission staff, uh, an attorney by the name of Albert Jenner out of Chicago. And what I discover about Albert Jenner is that he was a prominent attorney in Chicago whose biggest client was a man named Henry Crown. And Henry Crown, as of 1960, was controlling General Dynamics, which was one of America's largest military contractors. And General Dynamics had gotten a contract for something uh, called the TFX fighter jet, even though two other contractors had come in with lower bids and were better qualified for it. And so they were being investigated. There were hearings going on, and the Secretary of the Navy, who was tied to LBJ, had been forced to resign. There were indications that LBJ himself may have been somehow corruptly involved with the uh, getting and letting of this contract. And so this giant company was deeply concerned about where things were headed in uh, the U.S. Senate and in the Kennedy administration with Robert F. Kennedy's Justice Department investigating all of this. Henry Crown, Albert Jenner also, connections uh, into organized crime. And in fact, uh, Albert Jenner doing legal work on behalf of people tied in with uh, Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters. And so what you see, hmm. and I could go on for hours just on this point alone, George, what you see is that when you're willing to take the time to dig, 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 and to look at these things, you begin connecting the dots, and you see that people like Jenner, who was, I believe he was a president of the American Bar Association, that the most eminent citizens in some ways did business uh, with people who were considered to be the least reputable uh, citizens. And so when we hear all these stories that, well, maybe if Oswald didn't act alone, he was working for the mob, that's more disinformation, because it's an attempt to separate the activities of the so-called disreputable from the so-called reputable. Amazing. It's also, it just seems so incestuous, doesn't it? It's terribly incestuous. And this is, I think, the dirty little secret that, you know, they always say those who, who own the press, you know, write the history. 
And I think it's true that we are constantly assured that things are well in the land, that major citizens, the ones who make tremendous amounts of money, and then it's advertised constantly how good they are to the rest of us, that they are funding charitable works. Uh, you know, we the media barrages us with this, that they put their names on hospitals and museums and so on. Little discussion of uh, how that money was made, little discussion of the extent to which our government uh, and our courts and our organs of public opinion are compromised in the process. This is not discussed. The story of the making of the sausage is an ugly one. There's been some talk that uh, during 9-11, a number of Saudis were quickly flown out of the country and that their involvement may be a little more extensive than we've been led to believe. What do, what do you hear there? Um, spent some time down in Florida investigating a um, an incident right around the time of 9-11. And if you like, I can, can go briefly into yeah, that. Yeah, please, go ahead. Essentially, uh, right at the time of 9-11, when it was revealed that a number of the alleged hijackers were Saudi, a majority of them actually, a number of people living in a, a gated community in Sarasota, Florida, contacted the authorities to say that their neighbors, who were Saudi, had been had disappeared, they thought, about 10 or days or two weeks prior to 9-11, and they just wanted to alert them. Eventually, the FBI came into the complex and did investigation, and we are told by by uh, people, including security officials of the uh, complex that the FBI discovered that, in fact, the Saudi family that had disappeared had previously hosted a number of the hijackers, and that through telephone record triangulation and so forth, that more of them had been connected to this house, discovered that the owner of the house was a top executive of a major Saudi company whose chairman was one of the most powerful members of the Saudi royal family, uh, the head of Saudi aviation. And so what we were able to do was we were able to connect the Saudi royal family to the hijackers themselves. How does this stuff happen? Well, there's a how does this stuff happen and how does this stuff never come out. Didn't Ruby also know Oswald? Um, you know, it seems like they probably did. Now, I'm glad you mentioned Jack Ruby, George, because Ruby is key to solving the Kennedy mystery. Turns out that that Ruby was not this sort of, you know, they'd make him out to be this two-bit hood and, uh, you know, nightclub owner who nobody knew. In fact, Jack Ruby appears to have been deeply connected into the Dallas Police Department. That's how he was able to get into the garage so easily when they were taking Oswald out in to shoot him. Uh, Ruby was connected all over the place. Ruby was, uh, uh, we in, there are indications that Ruby was an FBI informant. This is one of the reasons, only one of the reasons that the FBI wanted to cover up the truth about the Kennedy assassination, because that would have obviously been a problem for them, especially if Oswald and Ruby turn out to both have been FBI informants. Ruby also was very well connected in the courts with the judges, with the politicians. There was actually a formidable drug trade going on there that was linked and tolerated and all of this stuff gambling all woven together and so again you have that same theme of the underworld and the overworld working together and then of course the overworld denying that it could possibly know anything about these people so uh, yes absolutely crucial to that story are we losing grips of the country you know the more i ponder the uh, kennedy assassination what happened uh, the more I conclude that in 1963, we really saw uh, some kind of a, I guess you could call it a military coup, although it was bigger than the military, you, uh, the removal of the president and essentially the kind of the end of democracy in this country. And I think that when you ask, are we losing grip? I, I think we already lost grip. And, and I do, but I do uh, agree with the sentiment there that uh, things are getting worse. And one of the things that troubles me deeply is how few Americans seem to be aware of this. Uh, it's certainly not something that you hear in ordinary conversation. There does not seem to be 
uh, an awareness or a concern uh, that we may be plunging ourselves into some kind of profound darkness. Uh, and when you plunge yourself too deep, you you just can't emerge from it. Jim Garrison, what did you think of his work? Well, you know, it's interesting because he was another figure who's been caricatured and demonized. Uh, and the more you look at what he did, the more you realize that he was something of an American hero, uh, flawed to be sure, just as the Kennedys were, but also doing some fairly bold, important work that he was about it. You know, people like Garrison and uh, Mark Lane and so on were among the few who were really willing to risk their careers and, and perhaps their lives to get to the bottom of this. And so much of Garrison's work was very, very important. What, for you, Russ, is probably the most sensational aspect of the Kennedy assassination? Um, boy, if I had to pick something, what would I think was so amazing? I mean, I suppose it would be the synchronicity uh, in the case. It would be the just the incredible number of coincidences. Let me give you an example. Uh, several years earlier, a group of men went into a truck dealership in Louisiana and they said they wanted to buy a bunch of trucks, as I recall. That was the, they were saying something about Cuba, using them for Cuba. According to the people who worked at the car dealership, one of them said, my name is Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, this is probably, we think this is before the a plot against Kennedy was ever hatched, and this was when Lee Harvey Oswald was living in the Soviet Union at the time. Now, how could it be that so early there were people already attempting to put his name out there and to make him out to be something that he was not. My, my conclusion from that, and I'm still thinking about it, is that Oswald may have been an extremely important intelligence asset, extremely important, that they were setting him up to do some very, very important things with Cuba, with the Soviet Union, and that the uh, Kennedy plot was basically grafted onto it late in the game. Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, unbeknownst to him, I, I think when he came out of that police office and said, I'm a patsy, he truly was. That's right. He truly was. And this is a man. I think that the, the tragedy there is that Lee Harvey Oswald probably was a great American patriot. Now, that will seem like a splash of cold water in some people's faces, but I think the point is that this is a young man who came from a difficult background and who managed actually to excel. I mean, according to Marina and other people, uh, when, when they met him in the Soviet Union, they thought that he was from some part of the Soviet Union because he spoke such excellent uh, Russian. And the question would emerge, how does a, uh, a Marine, who that was not his language, how does he speak Russian so well? I mean, this was a fellow who apparently, he appears to have excelled on so many different levels. My belief at this point is that he was some kind of a covert officer for the U.S., uh, in that he was uh, serving what he thought was his country. And so at the 11th hour, when they were willing to throw him to the wolves, I think that would just dawned on him that, you know what, even I'm expendable, and all of this stuff I was told about serving your country means absolutely nothing. I would guess, Russ, that they had Oswell picked out way before the assassination occurred, which they probably planned shortly after Kennedy got elected. I mean, I think it's entirely possible. We do know that a number of the presidents were assassinated, again, by purported lone kooks. And if you look at Franklin Roosevelt, then there are several books on this. There was a uh, planning of a coup, so-called Wall Street coup, where uh, Wall Street bankers decided that his uh, post-Depression strategy was uh, too uh, socialistic, a term that's also used, by the way, uh, to uh, handicap Obama in the few areas where he tries to do something independent, and that there was uh, an effort to recruit the military to overthrow FDR. Ross, thanks for being on the program. Uh, fascinating subject matter, isn't it? I what? certainly think it's interesting. Well worth continuing to dig into.